One of the challenges of embedding reporters with frontline troops was the potential for images of horrific violence, death and blood to be disseminated live to the home front. After all, in the eyes of the military, much of the legitimacy of the war depended on the ability to frame the war as clean and surgical. So while it could not be prevented in principle, keeping the horrors of war out of sight remained one of the key objectives of US decision makers. One way of curtailing the potential for such horrors to be seen was to set strict conditions on what embedded reporters were allowed to show and write about. This was particularly the case with the visual portrayal of death, blood and atrocity. Two examples are instructive in that regard. And they give us an insight into what happened when news reporting either violated the rules of embedding or when they captured atrocities on camera. The first example is the story of Kevin Seitz. In 2004, Seitz embedded with US Marines as a freelance war reporter for NBC in Iraq. During the siege of Fallujah, the biggest battle fought by the US military since Vietnam, he shot footage of a gruesome incident in which a US Marine killed a wounded Iraqi captive lying on the floor of a mosque. This film footage was broadcast all over the world. But in the United States, not a single television station showed this footage. Why this was the case remains controversial. The most plausible explanation is that political pressures from higher up and media self-censorship resulted in the footage not being shown. Frustrated by this, Seitz uploaded his footage on his personal blog, which is how the story eventually reached the US public. But this also marked the end of Seitz in the embedding program. The second example is the story of Zoraya Miller, an award-winning photojournalist. In 2008, Zoraya was embedded with a Marine battalion and captured the aftermath of a suicide bombing in Iraq's Anbar province. In the attack, civilians and three high-level US Marines were killed. Zoraya captured a number of images showing the aftermath of the bombing depicting Iraqi victims and also a number of American fatalities. In accordance with military guidelines, after the relevant families had been notified and after consulting other soldiers, Zoraya decided to publish the photos on his blog and he included a photo of a deceased but unidentifiable American soldier. These images were later circulated widely by media organizations. Subsequently, the army requested that Zoraya remove the photos from his blog, on the grounds that the display of a dead US Marine in military fatigues was prohibited. When Zoraya declined to remove the images, the army disembedded him and sent him home. Both Seitz and Miller, in different ways, shot footage of war that was depicting atrocities and dead US soldiers. And what makes this story so interesting is that in either case, the footage, which represented a real aspect of the conflict they were covering, was shielded from the US and wider publics. The reasons in each case are different, but it allows us to see how such footage was held back from the public. And it gives us an insight into how, in spite of the live coverage of war reporting today, these images and certain news stories can still be withheld. And it gives us an insight into the reasons why, even in an age of satellite phones and frontline news reporting, the image of clean war is still being upheld. What we have seen is how the US military, on a number of occasions, has changed and retrofitted its media strategy. From the defunct Vietnam model to the media blackouts in Grenada and Lebanon, from the framing of war as a spectacle in the 1990s 
to the 2003 Iraq war, where the Pentagon's PR strategy was modeled on reality TV. It gives us a glimpse not only into the strategic importance the Pentagon attaches to the media as a soft power weapon, but also into the level of sophistication and innovation with which these media strategies are implemented. And it raises important questions. Questions of the role a democratic free press is playing at times of war. To what extent does it still live up to its self-proclaimed role as the fourth estate? Questioning and critically engaging with government policies in times of war. To what extent is the media and democratic states able to report the reality of war? These are difficult questions and the answers might be troubling. But one thing seems clear. U.S. warfare has become mediatized to such an extent that practices of warfare can no longer be fully fathomed unless one accounts for the role of media within it. In other words, it puts Rumsfeld's remarks into perspective. Yes, Rumsfeld was right in saying that never before had a major war like Iraq been waged in a transformed media environment. Furthermore, he was right in saying that U.S. adversaries have been quick to exploit digital new media technology whilst the U.S. military has been slow to adjust. But Rumsfeld's speech in February 2006 obscured the scale and scope of the Pentagon's media strategy. A media strategy that had already been in place for several decades. Thus, Instead of the suggested five-and-dime store, the U.S. military in 2006 was operating more like Walmart in an eBay world.